On clear, silent nights, when you lift your gaze to the heavens, the moon appears as the largest, brightest orb in your sky. So familiar is it that it feels almost mundane, a constant companion. Yet the more you study it, the more the moon reveals itself as profoundly mysterious. Strangely, from our vantage point on Earth, the moon and the sun appear almost the same size. How can this be? In truth, the sun's diameter is more than 400 times greater than that of the moon, but it also lies about 400 times farther away. This perfect cosmic coincidence gives rise to the illusion of equal size. Still, the balance is not always exact. The moon travels along an elliptical orbit around Earth, and our planet itself orbits the sun in an ellipse, so sometimes one appears a little larger than the other. Our planet, Earth, is itself peculiar, not only for harboring life, but also for the remarkable scale of its single lunar companion. Consider Venus, often called Earth's twin, because of its similar mass and size, yet it has no moon at all. Then there is Mars, only about half the size of Earth, whose moons are tiny. The larger of the two, Phobos, is merely 22 kilometers across. The smaller, Deimos, is only 12 kilometers wide. They are so diminutive that both could easily fit within a single major city. And yet, in the vast gallery of the solar system's moons, our moon is not the largest. Ganymede, the largest satellite of Jupiter, holds that title. But even it is only somewhat larger than our own moon. Meanwhile, Jupiter is 318 times more massive than Earth, a true giant among planets. Sometimes you cannot help but wonder, did someone leave the moon here as if by mistake so that humanity would forever question it? In the crucible of the Cold War, the United States poured its ambition into NASA. On the 20th of July, 1969, Apollo 11 landed on the moon. Astronauts brought home hundreds of kilograms of lunar rocks and dust. And when scientists analyzed them, they discovered something astonishing. The chemical composition of moon rocks is almost indistinguishable from that of Earth's crust. This revelation sparked a profound question. Could the moon have formed from the Earth itself? If it were gravitationally captured by Earth, its composition would likely differ significantly, and yet the moon is far too large to be a simple satellite captured out of space. To explain this, scientists proposed a dramatic and violent genesis. In the early days of our solar system, a Mars-sized protoplanet dubbed Theia crashed into the young Earth. The cataclysmic impact ejected a vast amount of material into orbit. Over time, that debris coalesced into the Moon, while the remainder of Theia merged with Earth, sinking into its core. Though compelling, this theory is still just a hypothesis, debated among researchers with variations of detail. Still, even with this model, our moon holds more secrets than we yet understand. Exploring it was not merely a matter of national prestige or a stepping stone to the cosmos. It is a mirror, a key to understanding our own world. In 1961, the Russian scientist Mikhail Zeller proposed an idea far ahead of its time that water might exist at the lunar poles in places so deeply shadowed that sunlight has not touched them for billions of years. But the world paid little attention. After all, how could water survive on a world like the moon? It has no atmosphere to protect it, no magnetic field to shield it, no weather, no life, under the harsh glare of daylight, surface temperatures soar above 120 degrees Celsius. In the long lunar night, they plummet to 170 degrees Celsius. The ground is coated in ultrafine dust, sharp as powdered glass, and the surface is constantly bombarded by unfiltered solar radiation. If water truly existed there, 
surely it would either evaporate immediately or be torn apart by the relentless energy of the sun. And yet, if the moon did hold water, the implications would be profound. Water is the cornerstone of life and the foundation of exploration. A steady supply of it would allow humanity to build outposts without fear of thirst. Water can be broken into oxygen for breathing and agriculture, and hydrogen the lifeblood of rocket engines. Finding water on the moon would not just be a discovery, it would be the first real step into an interplanetary future. In 2009, NASA launched one of the boldest missions in its history, L-Cross. Its plan was unconventional, almost shocking to crash a massive metal impactor into the moon with enough force to blast a plume of debris high above the surface. The mothership would then fly through that plume, analyzing it for water. The impactor struck a crater near the lunar south pole at nearly 9,000 kilometers per hour, and the results stunned the scientific community. Elcross confirmed what many had only dared to hope. Within that rising column of lunar dust was water, not a trace, not a whisper, but a significant amount. For the first time, humanity had direct evidence of ice on the moon, trapped in the dark, frigid pockets where sunlight had never reached. But the story did not end there. New observations revealed something even stranger. Water wasn't only hiding in shadowed craters, it existed on sunlit regions of the moon as well. This seemed impossible. Sunlight should destroy it. And yet, in 2020, NASA's SOFIA Observatory, a powerful infrared telescope mounted on a Boeing 747 detected molecular water in illuminated areas of the lunar surface. This discovery opened an entirely new mystery. Where did this water come from? How does it survive? What prevents it from vanishing instantly into space? Scientists began to formulate new ideas. One hypothesis suggests that water is created in place through a dance of cosmic chemistry. Solar wind particles, streams of protons from the sun, bombard the moon's dusty surface. These protons interact with oxygen bound within lunar minerals, forming hydroxyl groups or even true H2O molecules. Some of these molecules may become trapped inside microscopic voids in the lunar soil, held there, however, briefly before heat drives them back into space. These revelations ignited intense interest across the globe. Nations suddenly felt the urgency to return to the moon, not out of curiosity alone, but out of competition. China, India, Russia, Japan, Europe, and the United States all began to race once more. India's Chandrayaan-1 mission carried NASA's M-cubed spectrometer, capable of detecting water by reading the moon's reflected infrared light. M-cubed delivered a breakthrough, strong evidence of hydroxyl and possibly water across many regions of the moon, not just the poles. Even areas bathed in sunlight showed signs of a continuing cycle water forming, breaking apart, migrating, and becoming trapped, all dictated by the shifting balance of temperature, light, and solar wind. Then came China's Chang'e 5, a mission that returned lunar samples for the first time in more than 40 years and reshaped our understanding of lunar water yet again. Chinese scientists announced the discovery of a previously unknown mineral in the Chang'e 5 samples. They named it ULM1, a type of hydrated salt containing a remarkable 41% real H2O by composition. Its chemical formula, ammonium magnesium trichloride hexahydrate. This was a scientific milestone. It meant that water on the moon was not merely ice in darkness or fleeting molecules on illuminated ground. It also existed in stable chemical form, locked within minerals. And suddenly, 
the moon's value changed. Water became more than a scientific curiosity, it became the oil of space. Today, a new lunar race is rising quiet, determined, and far more ambitious than the one that came before. China, working alongside Russia and several partner nations, is preparing to reach the moon's south pole before 2029, laying the foundations for a robotic outpost by 2030. Across the world, the United States is advancing its own vision through the Artemis program, Artemis I, uncrewed, Artemis II, carrying astronauts once more into deep space, and Artemis III, aiming to return humans to the lunar surface for the first time since 1972. The race will not stop, but beneath the surface of competition lies a deeper question. Are we exploring the solar system for humanity or exploiting space for profit? In 2024, China's Chang'e 6 mission achieved a milestone no nation had ever accomplished. Returning samples from the far side of the moon, a hemisphere forever turned away from Earth. And what those samples revealed was astonishing. The far side rocks were brighter, coarser, denser, and covered with thicker layers of dust. Their structure differed entirely from the near side we thought we knew. Even more surprising, the lava flows they found were much younger, suggesting the moon stayed geologically alive longer than scientists imagined. But the true revelation came in the form of a new mineral chungite, a transparent crystalline substance containing helium-3, one of the rarest materials in the universe and a potential key to near limitless clean energy. Helium-3 is the dream fuel of fusion reactors, producing power without the dangerous cascade of high-energy neutrons. It streams from the solar wind, but Earth's magnetic shield blocks it. The moon, exposed and silent, has soaked it up for billions of years like a cosmic sponge. Yet, the dream comes with a cost. To extract just one ton of helium-3, we would need to mine, sift, and heat 150 million tons of lunar soil. And humanity still has no commercial fusion reactor capable of burning it efficiently. For now, helium-3 is more a promise than a prize. But the moon holds other treasures, especially regolith, its dusty, ancient soil. Unexpectedly, regolith contains 40-45% oxygen by weight locked inside metal oxides. Heat it, pass electric current through it, and oxygen emerges air for breathing, oxidizer for fuel, the foundation of survival. Regolith can even become building material. Transporting concrete from Earth is impossible, but giant 3D printers can melt lunar soil and sculpt it into bricks, roads, radiation-shielded domes, the skeleton of the first lunar cities. Yet this soil is no gentle garden bed. Lunar regolith is the product of 4.5 billion years of meteor bombardment, a powder of shattered rock, sharp as ground glass. On Earth, wind and water soften sand. On the moon, in airless silence, every grain remains jagged, electrified by the sun, clinging to everything it touches, spacesuits, visors, machinery. For NASA's engineers, it is a genuine nightmare. The moon also hides rare earth metals, not truly rare, but difficult and environmentally destructive to extract on Earth. China already dominates global supply. As demand rises, the idea of mining them on the moon becomes increasingly attractive. But all of this raises a critical question. Who owns the moon? The Outer Space Treaty forbids weapons and territorial claims, but says nothing clear about resource extraction. In truth, the rule may simply become, whoever arrives first, chooses first. And that is why mapping water and securing strategic sites is now the heart of every lunar strategy. Finding water, mining minerals, building infrastructure. These are the first strokes on the canvas of a new era, 
one where humans don't just visit the moon, they live, work, and dream upon it. The moon is no longer a distant lantern in the night sky. It has become an opportunity, a challenge, and a mirror reflecting the future we wish to build. China's robotic explorers are already studying every grain of lunar soil, preparing for a permanent presence. NASA, constrained by short missions, surveys quickly and leaves. But to live on the moon, one must understand it deeply. And for now, quietly, steadily, China is leading the way.